edition of Airwaves, the F-35C launches from EMALS and into the future of naval aviation. Plus, the history behind Hangar 1, home to Navy airships for nearly 100 years. And meet the heavy lift helicopter that's worth its weight in loads. We're navigating the news of NAVAIR. Welcome to this edition of Airwaves. I'm Michael Prue. I'm Chief Michael Johnson. Thanks for joining us. A major milestone for the future of naval aviation as electromagnetic aircraft launch system connects with the carrier variant, the F-35C, for a successful first launch. Basically, we're testing two programs, the JSF F-35 and the EMALS electromagnetic catapult. Yeah, we're here to have a UK presence to witness it, see, see if I can, you know, bring any insight. Not that I have any, but you know, maybe go away with a little, you know, with a lot more knowledge yeah. about how cats traps work on big decks. No experience for me. Normally, I'm out to sea testing equipment on board the ship, so doing it here at test department, new world, different platform, different situation. It is kind of symbolic, isn't it? it it's uh, uh, new and new and newer. I guess is uh, is the way to describe it. Um, it's exciting and it's uh, very evident by the uh, emails team here at uh, Likers that they're excited to have uh, the F-35 up here on their catapult. Uh, basically we expect to get the F-35 off the deck and we've tested the emails with previous aircraft that we already use out in the fleet. So now we're testing the F-35 on the emails, making sure it doesn't have any problems and it gets off the ground. The idea really is to define the compatibility both of our hookup uh, here with the system our uh, electromagnetic uh, compatibility of the system uh, with uh, the airplane, and then uh, to verify what the load spectrum uh, looks like uh, during the launch as compared to the uh, steam catapult impulse. Well, the good thing is that this is the home for naval aviation when it comes to all-ray equipment. We have all the catapults, the resting gear, everything that the fleet has, we have it here in Lakehurst. So this is the ideal platform for it to test on. You know, to get UK faces and uniforms in at this stage is, you know, nearly un unprecedented. And for us, the benefits will be huge. Being in 22 years, I'm used to steam catapults, I'm used to resting gear, hydraulic systems, pneumatic systems. So this is definitely a big change, you know. We're not going to have the typical picture of launching on the flight deck, seeing the steam rise from the catapult. You know, that's going to be something to get used to. It's a whole new experience for me working so closely with industry and with the other nations. Uh, and it, it, it's been great. It's been absolutely fantastic. Working together to improve financial information and achieve audit readiness. That's the goal of DOD's Financial Improvement Program. During a recent visit to Congress, Vice Admiral David Archizel confirmed NAVAIR's commitment to DOD and DON financial improvement initiatives. I am personally committed to the Navy's Financial Improvement Act initiatives achieving and sustaining audit readiness by standardizing financial processes to provide accurate and audible information that supports program execution decisions is one of my top priorities. NAVAIR performed a financial assessment of the E2D Advanced Hawkeye program to show financial accountability of a major acquisition program. Lessons learned from the E2D project will help to improve the financial performance of naval aviation programs across the enterprise. You can learn more about NAVAIR's Financial Improvement Program on the NAVAIR News page at www.navair.navy.mil. The AH-1 Zulu has deployed with its sister aircraft, the UH-1 Yankee, for the first time. The Cobra and the Huey are operated by the 11th Marine Expeditionary Unit deployed aboard the USS Macon Island. The Zulu serves as a primary role in assault support. Its upgraded target and communication systems allow Marines to operate Zulu at a safe distance from the enemy. The Zulu is compatible with the Yankee, a big advantage when forward deployed. One of the most important things for the Marines is that this aircraft shares 84% of its parts with the UH-1Y. And that means that when you send aircraft to uh, aboard ship or out to forward operating bases or any kind of expeditionary environment, we drastically reduce the footprint of sending that aircraft forward. The Cobra is scheduled to be fully operational in 2020.
When Hangar 1 was built at Naval Air Station Lakehurst, it was the largest hangar in the world. Home to commercial and military airships for nearly a century, Hangar 1 is rich in aviation triumph and tragedy. I guess it would be safe to say that Lakehurst is primarily known as the site of the Hindenburg disaster. But it was the Cape Canaveral of its day. Uh, the best and the brightest came here in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s to learn lighter than air technology, which was cutting edge. Commissioned in 1921, Lakehurst Naval Air Station served as a center of naval lighter than air activity. At the end of World War I, the Navy purchased the coastal site from the Army for just over $13,000. It was an important strategic asset because the Navy wanted to operate airships as a defensive perimeter to patrol out to sea. Uh, but airships got very, very large very fast. The first major facility at Lakehurst was Hangar 1, a gigantic structure built to house the airships. Hangar 1 was the largest structure of its day, measuring 966 feet from door end to door end. This hangar had the distinction of housing all four of the Navy's rigid airships, and these were commissioned ships. They actually, you know, had pennant numbers of uh, USS Shenandoah, USS Los Angeles, USS Akron, and USS Megan. When they put the Hindenburg in here in 1936, twice, uh, she literally cleared with 15 inches on each end with the doors closed. During World War II, the Navy used airships to patrol the coastline, protecting American ships from submarine attack. In 1961, the Navy closed the lighter than air program, but this wasn't the end of Hangar 1. One guy got an idea. He said, if we put the Navy's largest training device in the hangar, we will probably be able to stave off demolition. Today, Hangar 1 houses Colossus, a fully equipped mock-up of an aircraft carrier. Sailors man the deck plates of Hangar 1 before heading out to sea. Today, the Houston Astrodome and the Vehicle Assembly Building at Cape Canaveral are larger interior spaces. but. We like to say Hangar 1 was the first Cape Canaveral, and uh, we do it with some pride. This year, the centennial of naval aviation, the first Navy airship commissioned in 50 years, returned to Hangar 1, proving the need for lighter-than-air technology has stood the test of time. I mean, even though the, the doors are 1,350 tons and take 10 minutes to open, it's uh, been a, a favorite of airship operators because it has windows along both sides, and it's kind of nice to work in a building where you can see. KMAX is the Navy's first ever cargo unmanned aircraft system to deploy in support of troops overseas. Capable of remote control delivery, this heavy lifter resupplies while saving lives. Carrying cargo and keeping troops out of harm's way, that's the goal of KMAX the Navy's first ever cargo unmanned aircraft system to deploy in an operational environment. KMAX is a, uh, it's, it's a logging helicopter. It's used for cargo ex exclusively. It's really a short haul, heavy lift helicopter. KMAX recently completed cargo testing, proving its power to carry loads of up to 6,000 pounds. Actually, this aircraft is very reliable. The basic airframe has hundreds of thousands of flight hours on it. We're very confident it can do its job. KMAX offers remote delivery to the battlefield, reducing the need for ground convoys and the troops that support them. We do unmanned missions to support the warfighter, takes trucks off the road, potentially will save lives. That's it for this edition of Airways. See you on the flight line.